Uh, okay, well, we're struggling with intentionality, and I'm going to explain how it works. Now, essentially, uh, there are uh, two parts, or if you like, three parts uh, to the course. Uh, the first part is mainstream philosophy of mind. And that, as you know by now, is mostly about uh, the so-called mind-body problem. And I, I take you through a whole lot of views that I think are vary between uh, the implausible and the preposterous. <laughs> Uh, but in any case, a whole lot of very smart philosophers take them seriously, uh, so I have to I have to explain them to you. And uh, the the background I want you to understand goes back to Descartes. And Descartes uh, really is the shadow uh, that is cast over the philosophy of mind for the past three and a half centuries. Essentially, uh, Descartes thinks uh, that the mind is only incidentally connected to the body. Uh, the soul leaves the body when the body dies, and it leaves because the body dies. Now, to Aristotle, that would have seemed incredible. Uh, rather, uh, for Aristotle, uh, <clears throat> roughly speaking, the body dies because the soul leaves it. The soul is the animating form of the body. Uh, and it's, this was a major shift in our whole way of thinking. Uh, and again, I think it's a disaster. I think both Aristotle and Descartes are wrong, uh, because in the way that they meant uh, the soul, there isn't any such thing. Uh, there are conscious states. Uh, they are produced by the brain. They exist in the brain. And the reason uh, that they stop at death is the same reason digestion stops at death. And that is, uh, there's nothing uh, to do the causal work. There's no mechanism anymore uh, that carries on the processes necessary to cause and sustain consciousness. Okay, now I want you to understand consciousness. And I want you to understand all issues. And now we're coming to the second part of the course, which to me is more important. And then finally, at the end, depending on how much time we have left, I'll talk about applications of these issues to a whole lot of other problems, uh, specifically the free will problem and the problem of skepticism and so on. But there are uh, two main parts of the course, mainstream philosophy of mind and the theory of intentionality. And then within the theory of intentionality, I, uh, at the end, I'll say more about application of this to other philosophical problems such as uh, uh, skepticism and the problem of the freedom of the will and determinism, the explanation of human behavior, the creation of social reality, and all that other stuff. So if we have enough time, I want to solve all the problems of philosophy uh, uh, between now and summer vacation. But we may not make that, so let's get as far as we can. Okay, now today I'm just going to resume the discussion we were having of intentionality. Are there any questions about anything so far? Your next paper is due on um, uh, uh, thir Thursday, right? I mean, uh, a day after uh, tomorrow. Is it, uh, the no, when is you already handed it? What? A week? From, okay, all right, all right. I, I don't want to get you confused. Okay, so you have enough time to do it. And this is a shorter paper. We, the philosophy department has a workload agreement uh, with the with our GSIs, and I don't want to overburden them. Now, normally what we do is we hire outside readers, uh, but we're, we have less cash now than we used to have. So we'll have the, the other papers will be shorter uh, than, the, uh, than the first paper. Okay, any bureaucratic questions or any other questions uh, before we resume the discussion? Okay, last time I suggested uh, that the key to understanding intentionality is uh, the capacity of the mind uh, to represent objects and states of affairs in the world. Uh, the, if you wanted a slogan, uh, the key to intentionality is mental representation, and mental representation is defined by conditions of satisfaction. Uh, every intentional state with a propositional content and a direction of fit is a representation of its conditions of satisfaction. Uh, beliefs are supposed to represent how things are in the world. Desires represent how we'd like them to be. Intentions represent how we intend to make them be, and so on. 
Okay, that's the broad picture. Now we need to go into some uh, detail. And the first immediate question that arises is, well, what do you say about intentional states uh, uh, that have a presupposed direction of fit? What about the emotions? And what do you say about intentional states like love and hate uh, that don't have entire or don't need to have entire propositional contents? You can just love Sally and hate Bill and admire uh, Jimmy Carter without an entire propositional content. There may be associated propositional content. You might love the fact that Sally's a Republican, uh, 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 but you don't have to have a propositional content in order to love or hate somebody. So what should we say about them? And what about uh, the intentional states uh, like being glad about something or being proud or being ashamed? where you seem to take the fit for granted. <clears throat> Does pride have conditions of satisfaction? It seems funny to think of being proud as having conditions of satisfaction like belief <clears throat> and desire. So we need to answer these puzzles. And I said the first step in answering them is to see uh, that in general, intentional states only function in conjunction with other intentional states. You can only have a belief if you've got a lot of other beliefs. You can have the belief uh, that uh, Barack Obama is president of the United States only if you have a lot of other beliefs, such as the belief that the United States is a republic, that presidents get elected, that they occupy a, a position of some uh, power and authority, and so on. It's hard to make a, a fixed list of, of the various intentional states involved in having that particular belief, but it seems that you have to have some uh, beliefs in order to have that belief and so on with desires. In order to have one desire, you got to have other beliefs and desires. Now that view uh, that <clears throat> our intentional states only come in holistic networks has got a name. It's called holism. Uh, and the holism here has to do with the fact uh, that for English speaking people uh, speakers, it's hard to pronounce the W. It's hard to say holism. So we just say holism. It doesn't mean it's got a hole in it. It just means there's a whole lot of stuff uh, involved in it. Uh, and the general principle of the network is that any intentional state only functions. That is, it only determines its conditions of satisfaction within a network of other intentional states. Okay, now another distinction I introduced was the distinction between ordinary representations like beliefs and desires and those that, <clears throat> that involve you in a direct and immediate causal contact with a condition of satisfaction such as perceptions. So when I actually see my hand raising this cup, I don't just have a representation of my hand uh, raising my cup. I see the damn hand and the damn cup. Uh, that is to say, they're directly presented. So a subclass of representations I call presentations because you're directly presented with the conditions of satisfaction. You don't, st there's, you don't stand at one remove from the condition of satisfaction in a way that you do if you just think about raising your hand or you write a, a, a sentence on a sheet of paper about raising your hand. Those are representations. Now, why do I say presentations are a subclass? Well, by definition, anything is a representation if it has a content and conditions of satisfaction. And uh, the uh, visual experiences have that. So they are a kind of representation, but they're a very special kind because they involve this immediacy. You're immediately in touch with the world when you uh, see it or when you act on it. When I raise my arm, I don't just represent my arm going up. I actually cause it to go up immediately by an intentional uh, state, my intention and action, that has the going up of the arm as its conditions of satisfaction. It presents, it doesn't just represent the arm movement. Okay, but now with all that in mind, let's go back and, and address some of these questions. What should we say about intentional states that apparently don't have a direction of fit, they just take the fit for granted. And what we find is quite interesting, namely that the network of beliefs and desires seems to be essential 
to the existence of any of those states, in particular to any of the emotions. And one way to see that is to see how beliefs and desires are constitutive, that is, they're part of the very existence of things like pride and shame. So let's say uh, I have pride that P, and you'd be surprised what people can be proud of. Well, we seem to be, the, the fruit seems to be ripening right here in front of our eyes. Uh, uh, if you consider things like uh, pride and shame, people can be proud of all sorts of things, but it, it turns out that there has to be some connection to the person. So if you're proud that P, uh, that implies, first of all, that you believe that P, but also it turns out that P has to have some connection to me uh, uh, or uh, to the person who has the pride. So if I say, I'm very proud of the elliptical orbit of the planets, well, there's something fishy about that. Or if I say, see this piece of chalk, I'm very proud of this piece of chalk. Well, you might say, well, what, you know, it's just a piece of chalk. What's the big deal? Why are you proud of it? What's, what's to be proud about? I can't say, look, it's a goddamn free country. If I want to be proud of this piece of chalk, I can be proud of this piece of chalk. There's something logically absurd about saying you're proud of this piece of chalk. There has to be some connection. Uh, you have to believe that P is connected to me. There has to be some connection. Uh, so I could tell a story. I mean, people, as I say, have all kinds of crazy beliefs about this piece of chalk. I am a taxpayer, and I've figured out that I have actually paid for this piece of chalk. Uh, so that's why I'm proud of it. All right, it doesn't make much sense, but at least it's on, it's, it's on the road to making sense. And again, about the elliptical orbit of the planets, I can't be proud of the elliptical orbit of the planets, but Johannes Kepler can, right? He discovered the elliptical orbits. If he wants to be proud of the elliptical orbits, he can. So there has to be uh, come some connection. You have to believe it, and you have to believe that P is connected to me. And it seems to me you have to find a desirable if you're proud of it, you have to want it to be the case that. So if I'm proud of my big nose, then I've, I, I, I can, I've got both to believe that I have a big nose and, and I, that it's, a, a, uh, uh, I, it's my nose, after all. It's very hard for me prou to be proud of your nose unless I can show that we're somehow related to each other. Uh, but furthermore, I've got to find it desirable that I have a big nose. I've got to think that this is a good thing. And in general, with pride, it seems to me that you have to have a desire that others know. Uh, it's a characteristic of proud people that they want to display <clears throat> that, or they want others to find out about the thing that they're proud of. Now, that's other things being equal. They may be modest as well as being proud, or they may be proud of some things <clears throat> that they rather people didn't know about. So, for example, if they some, have some elaborate scheme uh, for cheating uh, the federal government on income tax, they may be proud of their ingenuity, but other things being equal, they'd rather not know, or they'd rather other people didn't know because they'd have to go to jail. Uh, so uh, this last clause is, is, so to speak, other things being equal. They want others to know, to know about it. Okay, that seems to me characteristic of pride, uh, that you have these features, and then it's easy to see that in the case of shame, you just get a kind of, if I'm ashamed that Q, then I've got to believe that Q, and I've got to believe that Q is connected to me, and, but I've got to find uh, Q undesirable, that is, I desire that it not be the case that Q, and I don't want others to know, I desire that it's not the case, that this little squiggle means not in logic. So pride and shame are interestingly symmetrical. If you're proud of something, you've got to believe it. You've got to believe it's connected to you. You've got to think it's desirable. And you've got to want other people to know about it. Shame is exactly the opposite in that if you're ashamed, you've got to believe it that it exists. You've got to believe that it's got something to do with you. I can't be ashamed of the uh, uh, behavior of uh, 
uh, Muammar Gaddafi because it's got nothing to do with me. Now, I could tell you a story. Well, in fact, all humanity's one, and what a bad guy does anywhere, I am responsible for it. I mean, there are people who think like that. I don't, but that's a possibility. Okay, so in the case of shame, you got to believe it. You got to believe it's connected to you. You got to find it undesirable. You got to desire that it not be the case that Q, and you got to desire that other people not know about the stuff you're ashamed of. The characteristic physical gesture associated with shame is the urge to cover your face. Uh, people, I mean, the psychologists know this for a long time, that the urge to conceal uh, goes with feelings of shame. Well, is that all there is? to shame and pride? I don't think so. I think there are feelings that go with shame and pride. And you can illustrate that by taking another example. Uh, if you take fear, if you fear that P, then it seems to me you got to believe uh, that it's uh, possible that P, this a diamond means possible. Uh, you got to believe that it's possible at P, and you've got a desire that not P. So if you're afraid of something, you got to believe that it might happen, uh, and you've got to want that it not happen. So <clears throat> the question then arises, is that all there is to fear? I don't think so. Uh, I think there's more to fear than just believing something is possible and not wanting it to happen. Uh, and examples of this are everywhere. Uh, for example, um, <clears throat> uh, I believe that it's possible uh, that there will be an earthquake in Berkeley uh, in not very many years. And I very much want it not to happen for various real estate and personal reasons. Uh, I'd rather we didn't have any earthquakes along the Hayward Fault. Am I afraid? My friends in New York tell me, well, aren't you afraid? You ought to be afraid. Well, I'm not afraid. I suppose I ought to be, but I'm not actually. And you see this uh, 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 strongly in the case of uh, uh, forms of fear where you really are uh, afraid and you have more than just the belief and the, the desire. If you take terror, when you're terrified about something, if you have a, you're terrified that something is happening or is going to happen, uh, then you got to have a belief that it's possible that will happen. And it seems to me you got to have a strong desire that not pay. So if you're terrified about something, you got to believe it's possible, and you got very much to believe, uh, uh, to want that it not happen. But that's not all there is to being terrified or, or panicked. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, sometimes when I'm driving along the freeway, I look in my rear view mirror and I see the big red eye of the California Highway Patrol. I hope you've never had this experience. Uh, and I get a feeling in my stomach that I, I don't know if terror is the right, it's more like panic. I get a feeling of panic. Uh, and then it's some, uh, now I, I'm thinking, you know, I, I drive a car that looks like it's going fast even when it's parked and I was only going 85 and so why are we stopped here, officer, and it's really not a, a real problem. The highway was practically, well, you know, the kind of things you tell the highway patrolman. Uh, <clears throat> but the, in this particular case that I'm imagining, the cop wasn't chasing me. He was chasing the guy in the Ferrari who was going 95 and was going past me. So he goes right past me. Then I get a feeling in the pit of my stomach, it's called relief. I'm no longer uh, panicked, but I'm in a state of uh, relief. Now, there's an interesting fact about this, and that is some of the original feeling is left over. You still feel some of that nervousness. It's caused by epinephrine. It's caused by uh, adrenaline. And, and you get the adrenaline effect uh, in your stomach even after the uh, panic has gone. Okay, what I'm saying then is in these cases, the intentional content of belief and desire isn't enough. There's a feeling that goes along with it. And you can see this because to some extent the feeling is, can be carved off. You can still have some of the feeling left in your stomach even after the belief that you're about to be stopped by the police has gone away. All right, let me just summarize this and then I'll take questions. Uh, uh, what I want to say is this. 
every emotion and every complex intentional state involves beliefs and desires, or at least desires, and involves some other intentional states in the network. And though the intentional state itself, in the case of pride and shame, does not have conditions of satisfaction, it contains beliefs and desires, and they do have conditions of satisfaction. That raises a question, can we analyze intentional states into conjunctions of beliefs and desires? Is that all there is to having an emotion? And I think, no, there's much more involved than that. And typically, for example, there are feelings involved. In this case, I, I took the case of being terrified about something or panicked because there it seems to me you can, to some extent, carve off the feeling. Some of that feeling is left after you lose the belief and desire. You can't always carve off the feelings. I think if you, taste, if you take the example of lust, which is a very strong desire, you can't think, well, I could have uh, this very feeling of lust without any of the intentional content. I don't think you can. I think in the case of, of the very strong agitated forms of desire, you can't carve off the feeling. And I'm going to say more about that when I talk about the emotions. Anyway, uh, that's just a summary of how we deal with the complex cases. Now, Jennifer, you had your hand up. Uh, some people uh, do. I, 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 that's not one of my real problems. You don't feel guilty. No, I don't. I think uh, I feel stupid, uh, and that it, uh, is, is a problem. Uh, but uh, the metaphysical guilt, uh, it's not my problem, but at least not where cars are concerned. Uh, Maybe uh, difficult problems in philosophy. I feel guilty I don't have a satisfactory solution to the free will problem. Uh, but the fact that uh, I was in six speed and I was uh, uh, going uh, over the speed limit, I don't feel guilty about that. I'm sure I should, but I don't. Okay, other questions? Anyway, uh, the, but the, Jennifer's question raised an interesting question, and that is about the whole network. And all of these come in elaborate networks. You can't, uh, and let me uh, I take the case of love. I gave the example of, of an intentional state that didn't have a whole proposition, namely you're in love with Sally, let's say, or if you're a girl, you're in love with Billy, uh, let's say. Now, it seems to me the, the love itself doesn't have conditions of satisfaction, but lovers have to have a set of beliefs and desires, and they do have conditions of satisfaction. No, uh, notoriously, uh, the, the desires that lovers have about the beloved object or the beloved person vary. You get tremendous variety. But all the same, uh, you have to have some desires. If a man says, well, I'm desperately loved but totally indifferent, uh, then I want to say, yeah, that's not a case of being in love. You, you have to have some desires. So the bottom line of this discussion is that though the analysis of intentionality in terms of conditions of satisfaction apparently suffers from counterexamples of the presupposed fit and no propositional content. In fact, those are not such serious counterexamples as you might think because they all contain beliefs and desires, and those beliefs and desires do have conditions of satisfaction. Yes? Why does what? Perception has conditions of satisfaction? Yeah, why? Why? Yeah, why? because it can succeed or fail. Uh, uh, let me give you uh, a, a, an example. Uh, I hold this up and look at it. Uh, now, I have a conscious visual experience, but here's an amazing thing about that conscious visual experience. It's inherently normative. It sets conditions under which I'm getting it right or not getting it right. And the philosopher's favorite example is to, here is to say, suppose it's a hallucination. Now, the hallucination may be totally in, uh, indiscriminable from seeing the real thing. But in the hallucination case, I got it wrong. I thought it was a cup, but it wasn't a cup. It was only hallucination. Incidentally, it ought to arouse our suspicions that philosophers talk about hallucinations as if it was the most common thing in the world. Uh, I've never had a hallucination in my entire life, as far as I know. But philosophers talk as if, oh, you know, every day we have uh, hallucinations. We don't. And there, there seem to be also very culturally um, uh, determined. That is, uh, American drunks see pink elephants. 
Uh, but British drunks see pink rats. Why there should be this cultural difference, I, I don't know. I, I've had my share of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, but I've never seen a, a pink elephant or a pink rat, for that matter. Uh, but in any case, I, uh, the, uh, the short answer to the question is because it can succeed or fail. Any intentional state that can, see, can succeed or fail has conditions of satisfaction. And perception, like memory, has very special conditions of satisfaction. And they're just, uh, they're more fun than anything because not only it pr is it presentational, but it's non discrete. In a case of a belief, you break it up into a sentence, but in the case of perception, it's the whole visual field. It's everything you can see right now uh, that is a, a part of the uh, conditions of satisfaction of your perception. You're going to get a whole lecture on perception, so I'll, I'll give you the, all of that in, in uh, boring detail. Yes? Yes. Uh, so in your in, in intentionality, chapter one, yeah. you talked about how you thought intentional states were primitive in a sense. They yeah. cannot be reduced any further. Right. Um, I'm wondering why you don't think it's an interesting question, uh, like how beliefs can happen in a material world where most Right. Oh, no, I do think it's interesting. Uh, so let me answer this question. I, I said in the case of both perception and intentionality, uh, there is the detailed question about how it works. And then there is the big deal question, how is it possible at all? Now, in the case of consciousness, I spend most, time on the, most of the time on the big deal question. In the case of intentionality, I'm going to do the other route. I'm going to take you uh, through the details of how intentionality works. And I think if we get those right, uh, then the big deal question uh, is, uh, is it, it more or less automatically solved. I mean, if, uh, if by Easter I, you don't think I've solved it, we'll come back and we'll discuss it some more. I'll say more about it. Let me just finish answering your question, and then I'll give you another try. Okay. Let me state the big deal question. The big deal question in intentionality is, how can a piece of meat in your skull be about anything? I mean, it just doesn't seem to make any sense to say uh, this uh, hunk of uh, junk inside my skull is somehow about objects and states of affairs in the world. And you'll recognize that as a variant of the big deal mind-body problem. How can a piece of meat in my skull be conscious? Well, the answer is it is conscious uh, and, uh, and the, in the case of consciousness and their standard biological mechanisms by which consciousness is produced. We're uh, still pretty dumb about the details, but we know that it goes on in the brain and we think the thalamocortical system plays a special role. Okay, now the same way about uh, intentionality. And I get, you know, more or less every day emails saying, but how can you believe that this object, this brain, can be about anything. Uh, and the answer is, if you put it that way, you get a kind of mind boggle problem. You know, it just boggles the mind. But if you, if you put it in detail, how is it possible for an animal to be thirsty? Uh, then it doesn't seem like such a big deal. Then we know in, in, in some, well, not in complete detail, but we know in pretty good detail what are the mechanisms in the brain by which thirst is produced. I, and so uh, uh, my approach to the, I, to the big deal problem is to say, one, it happens. We know it happens. We know that people really do get thirsty or hungry or have desires and hopes and fears and beliefs and perceptions of various kinds. And two, we know that it's all caused by brain processes. So if you've got those two established, that it's real and that it's uh, an irreducible, and that it's caused by brain processes, then I think we've reduced the problem down to something which we haven't solved it, but at least it's manageable. Say some more. This is a crucial question. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, since you are interested in these primitives, do you think, like, is, are you using belief and desire as some of those primitives? That yes. Yeah. Here is um, I, our, our question. Can we reduce intentionality to something non-intentional? The answer is no. Why should we? It's like consciousness. Why should we be able to reduce it to something else? Anything you reduce it to has to have this capacity of representation, and that's already intentional. So any reduction is going to be circular. Now, as we speak, there are efforts to carry out this reduction. You can check Jerry Fodor, who's constantly making an effort uh, to get rid of intentionality. Uh, why? Well, as Fodor says, this is Jerry Fodor, well, F-O-D-O-R, uh, as Fodor says, if intentionality is real, it must really be something else. Why? Well, when you do the final 
uh, analysis of reality in terms of the weak and strong uh, 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 nuclear forces and electromagnetism and gravity. When you do your final story about reality, uh, there's not going to be any mention of intentionality or aboutness. And you recognize that that's the same mind boggle problem you get with consciousness. Yes, but suppose, uh, now this is me answering, suppose your final story about reality explains how uh, the molecular behavior uh, produces life and some living forms uh, uh, produce big uh, 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 neurons, uh, a special kind of a cell with axons and dendrites and all the rest of it, and massive co complex of those uh, produce consciousness and intentionality. You get a causal reduction, but not an ontological reduction. So I think this is characteristic of philosophy, is the feeling, look, it can't be like that. But we know, in fact, it is like that. Yes, we are conscious. Yes, we do have intentionality. And if you get a result that says, but you can't be conscious, you can't have intentionality, because we know that the world, that the world as described by physics and chemistry can't contain such things, then I want to say you have an impoverished view of physics and chemistry. You have a, a Cartesian view, and that's what I'm trying to shake you out of. Uh, you will understand these issues better than the, uh, well, in my opinion, you will better than the people in the profession because you will be free of the historical grip of these traditional categories. Okay, I saw some other hands up. I don't know if he was first, but I'm going to call on him and then you and then you. Okay, you're on. It seems like um, there's a strange relationship between the chemicals that go on, uh, that, are, that accompany or that are simultaneous with certain, like, feelings. Yeah. And in one regard, it seems like the, the, the uh, subjective feeling is caused by the chemicals. In other instances, it seems like uh, the chemicals are caused by the feelings. Yeah. Can you explain that? Really? Well, okay. Now, again, another very good question. It seems like in one way uh, the uh, feelings are caused by the uh, chemicals, but why can't the feelings cause uh, some behavior of the chemicals? And the answer is they do. Somebody puts a gun at my head and says secrete the neurotransmitter acetylcholine or I'll blow your brains out. I just did it, okay? I mean, I just, we had top-down causation. My conscious intention and action caused a chemical effect. It caused the chemical effect of my secreting acetylcholine. It's my favorite neurotransmitter. You're going to hear more about it. Uh, well, why? Because I mean, there are others that I love too, but that's one of my favorites because it's what enables us to move around. You can't, no neurotrans, no, uh, no um, acetylcholine, no skiing. Incidentally, it's a great season. I, the best season we've had since 1993. Not that I want to bore you with that, but it, uh, the snow is fantastic. Um, now, my giant slalom technique, I have to confess. Uh, I'm not going to make the team. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, I need a lot more work that I'm going to get. But in any case, uh, back to acetylcholine. Uh, how can there be such thing as top-down causation? Well, I still like Perry's example of that. Perry gives the example, you remember, of explaining the trajectory of the molecule that's inside the wheel. You can't explain the trajectory of the molecule without explaining the behavior of the whole wheel. The behavior of the whole wheel uh, will determine the trajectory of the molecule. Now, of course, the whole wheel itself is made of other molecules. So the top-down causation of the wheel requires the bottom-up causation of the molecules that constitute the wheel. But that's fine. That's how nature works. Everybody understands these metaphors are top down and bottom up. They're metaphors there. We ought, we ought to be suspicious, but they're irresistible. The bottom level is the level of little bitty things, molecules. The top level is the level of big things like wheels. And you get a top down causation where the facts about the wheel cause facts about the little bitty things. But that's only because the facts about the little bitty things by bottom up causation produ produces the solidity and permanent stability of the wheel. Okay, there were a couple other questions and then we'll move on. I think you're next and then you over there. Yes. You have to talk loud because I'm stone deaf. How would you describe the beliefs and desires that you have to whatever, Yeah. All right. Now, this is another interesting phenomenon and that is where you're in states of anxiety where you don't know what you're anxious about. That, I, I took it, was the case. I, and there are cases where you have um, mental, conscious mental states uh, with no intentionality. 
you wake up in a state of acute nervousness and anxiety. But if somebody says to you, well, what are you so nervous about? The answer is, I don't know. I'm not nervous about anything. I'm just nervous. And there are people like that. Now, uh, there is a hypothesis. I don't know if it's true. But the hypothesis is that all such cases involve the unconscious. Uh, there must be an unconscious intentionality. Now, I haven't told you about unconscious intentionality. And I, you're going to have to, we're going to have to have a theory of that. And it's something of a scandal that people don't see it as a problem. It is a problem. How can there be unconscious intentionality that functions causally? But you can't get on without it. You have to have a notion of the unconscious in order to explain all sorts of features of cognition. And we're going to come back to, uh, to that when I talk about the unconscious. Let me tell you the problem now. The problem right now is that the temptation is always to think that the model for the unconscious must be computational. There must be unconscious computations going on in the brain. OK, now let me give you an example of why that seems to me implausible. Um, uh, some of my dogs, I've had, as I've told you before, four dogs, uh, Frege, uh, uh, Russell, Ludwig, and Gilbert. And uh, some of them have been very good at catching tennis balls. Russell was fantastic at catching tennis balls. In fact, I didn't train him. He trained me. And, and I, I got so bored with throwing the tennis ball for him that I would just quit, go away. But when any stranger would come to the house, he'd train them to throw the tennis ball, especially like to catch it if you bounce it off a wall. OK, now how is it possible for Bertrand Russell Searle, who is a, a small dog, I, to catch a tennis ball off the wall. Well, the standard cognitive science explanation would go as follows. He has to do, unconsciously, a very large number of mathematical calculations. He has to operate on the principle that the angle of the plane of reflection is exactly equal to the angle of the plane of incidence. And he has to calculate the position of the ball on the assumption that it moves in a parabolic arc, uh, the flatness of whose trajectory is a function of impact velocity divided by the coefficient of elasticity with a small uh, deduction uh, for air friction and resistance. So that's what poor Russell is doing. He's doing a very large number of complex equations uh, when he catches the tennis ball. And wh why do people think that? Well, they ask themselves, how would you design a machine? Uh, if IBM was going to uh, design a, a tennis ball catching machine, that's exactly what they'd have to put into it. They'd have to put into it a whole lot of ways of taking in information from the visual system and then converting it into a whole lot of equations and then having a motor output that was a function of. And I've given you a very simple version of the actual version would be incredibly uh, complicated. OK, now I think that's probably almost certainly wrong about poor Russell. He was a wonderful dog, but he was not good at arithmetic, uh, much less higher mathematics. I, I don't think uh, Russell did all those calculations. Well, how did he do it? Well, how would I do it? Uh, the answer is I'd try to figure out where the damn ball is going to go, and then I'd put my mouth at that point. And that's what uh, Russell did. I'm sorry to bore you with these canine details, but I want you to see limitations of certain uh, forms of explanation in cognitive science. Uh, and I think that's how he did it. Now, there are unconscious processes going on in the brain that enable him to coordinate the visual information he gets with uh, the uh, motor output information, with uh, the, the, intention out, the visual intentionality uh, with the intention in action. Uh, and those are non-trivial. But I think we make a serious mistake if we think that it must all be done by a series of mathematical calculations. Russell wasn't that good at mathematics. OK, I'm going to come back to that, uh, too. But the short answer to your question is uh, not all conscious intentionality is intentional. Some, uh, some forms are, are non-intentional. Now, there's a guy at the back, and then we'll go on. Yeah. Uh, I have the same question. Oh, you've I've already answered your question? What, what you, uh, there are two different questions. There are lots of cases of intentionality uh, 
where there's uh, lots of cases of consciousness where there's no intentionality. That was his original case, where you wake up in a cold sweat, but you don't know what you're anxious about. I mean, that's different from the case where you woke up in a cold sweat because you're waking up from a terrible dream you just had. And then uh, the, uh, the intentionality is a form of fear. But there are forms of anxiety that have no intentional content. Now, the other point, I take it the last part of your question, had to do with beliefs and desires. Uh, and the point is, you need not have any beliefs and desires in these cases, where you just have a, a form of anxiety. You don't actually believe that the, uh, that the house is going to fall in on you, or that the earthquake is going to happen right now, uh, but you do have a form of anxiety that hasn't got any content. I saw one other hand up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, tell me the network and I'll tell you how it's formed. Uh, in the case of ourselves, uh, a large part of our networks are formed by early childhood experiences. You learn uh, members of the family, sources of food, uh, uh, objects that you can cope with and objects you can't cope with. But once you get much older, a great deal of your network is cultural. Uh, you, you're able to function uh, in society because you have a whole lot of uh, uh, beliefs and desires and habits and expectations that enable you to cope with a society. We're now in a situation where you can take it for granted that this is a class in philosophy uh, that the professor will talk and that the other people will ask questions and he'll answer the questions and so on. That's all, all of those are network assumptions. However, there is another feature which I have to talk about, and I'm going to talk about it now because it's the next topic, and that's what I call the background. In addition to the network of intentional states, there are a set of capacities, abilities, tendencies, dispositions, and stuff you just take for granted that enables the network to function but seems to me not properly thought of as further intentional states. So that's my next topic. Uh, now, look, let's hand in the, uh, the, the uh, attendance sheets now. I think anybody who's coming today ought to be here by now. Okay, let's go back to work. Um, why isn't the apparatus that I've described to you, uh, the apparatus of uh, propositional content, conditional satisfaction, direction of fit, all that, enough. Well, maybe it is. It's just that if you try to spell out the threads in the network, you get to a point where it seems that what you need in order to enable intentionality to function is more than just more beliefs and desires. In fact, it seems unnatural to think of it as beliefs and desires. Uh, so I gave you an example. Let's suppose that there was a point at which uh, Barack Obama decided, I'm going to run for the presidency of the United States. He formed a prior intention to run for the presidency. Uh, and I think that probably was such a point. It may have been gradual in its evolution, but he was under a lot of pressure. You should wait. It's not your turn. Let Hillary Clinton run this time, and you can run in eight years. You're still young. All this kind of stuff uh, that people are told. But he had enough sense to see, no, this is it. Grab the moment. Okay, now if you ask yourself, well, what does he have to believe and desire in order to have that intentional state? Well, it comes to quite a rich network, and I've mentioned several features about that. I've mentioned uh, that he's got to believe the United States is a republic, that it has elections every four years, that the winner's likely to be uh, the candidate of one of the two major parties. And furthermore, he's got to have a lot of desires. He's got a desire that people vote for me, that they work for me, that uh, I get uh, their votes in, not only in the election but in the nominating convention. Uh, I, I've got a desire that they um, uh, donate money to my campaign. So there's a huge inventory of beliefs and desires that somebody has to have in order to form the intention to run for the presidency of the United States. But if you started to write it all down, and it ought to worry us that philosophers, I'm included in this, I, I tend to say et cetera after a while. And that's the et cetera of laziness. You know, I mean, uh, why not? Let's do it. Let's write it all down, that all the stuff that he believes and desires. 
Uh, now maybe uh, there are some uh, uh, things that are marginal. You know, he uh, he may not have to believe uh, that Michigan has more electoral votes than Vermont. He might not be uh, worried about that. Uh, but in any case, there is a huge inventory of beliefs and desires. The problem is that if you were going to write it down, uh, then it looks like you'd never end, but there's a sense in which you never get started without assuming other things. I, some of the stuff you would write down would seem implausible to think of just as more beliefs about the political system. You'd never hear them in a political science course. So, for example, would you write down, elections in the United States go on at or near the surface of the earth, or uh, people generally vote only when they are conscious. Well, you know, if you thought elections were going to go on on the moon, you'd have a different kind of, of a campaign. Uh, and you have to assume that people are conscious. Or uh, voting is done by making marks on ballot papers or pushing a, a, a computer and not uh, by standing on your head or doing cartwheels. Well, I guess I, if you thought the way that people vote is uh, by eating apples, uh, or uh, by standing on their head, uh, then you'd have a different kind of a, a campaign. But it seems funny to me to think of those as further beliefs. They're things you take for granted. There are a whole lot of things that you simply take for granted. I gave you the example of intending to go skiing. Now, I have to take for granted a whole lot of other things. I have beliefs. I believe I, that I'm going at a time when there's not too much traffic, that by skiing on a weekday I have uh, smaller crowds, um, I, I, that uh, there's enough snow to ski on. Those are all beliefs. But a whole lot of other things involved uh, that I just take for granted. My ability to ski, for example, my ability to drive a car, my assumption uh, that gravitational attraction will continue uh, to operate in such a way as to enable me to drive there and, and to ski once I get on the mountain. All of those, I'm inclined to say, are part of the background. They're part of what is taken. For granted. Now, what is the argument that in addition uh, to the network of beliefs and desires, you need a background? Well, that's one argument that I just gave you, but there are other arguments. One of the things that uh, strikes me is that in the case of understanding any intentional state, it looks like you have to have more than just the explicit intentional content in the intentional state. Um, and a way to see that is to see how you interpret sentences. In the case of ordinary English sentences, nothing fancy about the sentences, it seems that there's a whole lot more that you need to understand the sentence than is actually contained in the literal meaning of the sentence. And this is most dramatically shown in the case of ordinary English verbs like cut or walk or run. If you take the occurrence of the word cut in sentences like Sally cut the cake and Bill cut the grass uh, and the tailor cut the cloth, and I cut my finger, then it seems to me obvious that the word cut means the same thing. And the linguists have a test for that. Can you do what's called conjunction reduction, where you can get rid of the uh, different occurrences of cut? And it works. If you say General Motors, has in, a General Electric has invented a new cutting device. It will cut cake, it will cut grass, it will cut cloth, it will cut fingers. Uh, then you can get rid of all of those cuts and just say it will cut a cake, grass, cloth, and finger. Uh, but now, if there are other occurrences of the word cut, which are metaphors where you can't do conjunction reduction, if you say Sally cut two classes, uh, you can't say, well, there's a wonderful device that will not only cut cake, grass, cloth, and fingers, but it will cut classes. Uh, that, uh, that doesn't make sense. So Sally cut two classes is a metaphor. Uh, the Raiders cut the roster is again 
a metaphor. Uh, the president cut the salaries of the professors. Uh, that's something that's pretty realistic right now. Uh, cut the salaries. All of those are metaphorical occurrences. And again, conjunction reduction won't work for these other things. You can't say, well, there's this wonderful device that'll cut uh, a, a cloth, grass, a cake, a skin, uh, but also will cut salaries, rosters, and classes. That's a bad joke, because the, the, those are metaphors. Another clue is, it's just a clue, some of these translate naturally into other languages, and some don't. Uh, if you're talking about French, for example, all of the literal cases translate directly into French. In the case of cutting your finger, um, you have to use the reflexive, je me suis coupé le doigt. Uh, but other than that, that translate dir directly from English uh, to French. But the metaphors don't translate. In, uh, last time I, I talked to people about cutting classes in Paris, you don't cut classes, you dry them out. You séché. It's the French no, um, um, mode of thinking. You sh Sally dried out two, or let's call her Delphine. Uh, Delphine dried out two glasses last week is what you'd have to say. I, uh, but you can't say cut. Okay, what does that tell us? Well, that seems to me to tell us uh, that the word cut means the same, and it's used in the same way in all these cases. But notice that the interpretation is quite different the conditions of satisfaction are completely different. If I tell Bill, now you've cut the grass, I want you to cut the cake, and he runs over the cake with a lawnmower, then I want to say he didn't do what I asked him to do. That is, the conditions of satisfaction are just now completely different. Similarly with Sally, I say, Sally, will you cut the grass? And she takes the cake knife and go and stabs the grass. She didn't do what I asked her to do. What counts as cutting the cake is, diff is a different sort of thing from what counts as cutting the, gra the grass and so on with these other examples. That is to say, the literal meaning of the sentence by itself is insufficient to fix the conditions of satisfaction, to fix the truth conditions. <coughs> it only fixes truth conditions relative to a network of beliefs and relative to a set of background practices. We have a background practice of cutting a cake, uh, a different background practice of cutting grass, and those background practices, what is the taken for granted ways of doing things, are what fixes the conditions of satisfaction in these cases. To put it uh, in, a, in a general form, Literal meaning by itself is never sufficient to fix truth conditions or other conditions of satisfaction. You need also a set of background presuppositions as well as uh, networks of beliefs and desires. You need a set of background presuppositions about how things are done, and it's only relative to that background that you get uh, the conditions of satisfaction. Now, that's an annoying result, and it runs uh, counter to our whole way of thinking about these issues over the past several centuries. The mistake that we tend to make is to think that all of our mental life uh, consists in a set of propositional content, in a set of explicit propositions. Some of these will be unconscious, and the task, or one of the tasks of the philosophers is to bring them to consciousness. So, uh, when I was... Starting out as a young philosopher, I thought one of my aims is to make all of our presuppositions fully conscious. Uh, but the difficulty with that project is you can't carry it out because their presuppositions don't take a propositional form. As I walk around this room now, I have a series of capacities that enable me to cope with a room, but those capacities cannot be represented as a set of beliefs. Do I actually have a belief that when I walk, it's best to put the heel down first and then shift the weight to the ball of the foot as I swing the other uh, leg forward? No, I just walk. I just haul off and do it. Uh, now, the latter part of Wittgenstein's career, uh, the, uh, the philosophical investigations, and especially his book called On Certainty, 
is devoted to this question. It's devoted to the background. And the point that Wittgenstein is making, and it's a point that I'm developing here, he makes it about epistemology, how you have to take certain for, things for granted in order to find out anything. The point I'm making is a general point. And the thesis of the background is this. Intentionality only functions. It only determines conditions of satisfaction relative uh, to a set of mental capacities, abilities, dispositions, ways of doing things, uh, uh, assumptions which are not them, which do not themselves consist in more intentional states. They don't themselves consist in further beliefs and desires. Now, if that's right, then the project of getting a full understanding of our intentionality, uh, of, of our cognitive capacities, by spelling them all out as a set of propositions, that's doomed in principle, because when they're functioning, they don't function as a set of propositions. They function as background abilities. Uh, I, uh, most skiers are not intellectuals, uh, but I am, and I'm constantly thinking about what's going on. Most ski racers never reflect on the physics of the ski or the physical principles involved. I'm interested in that kind of crap, so I'm always thinking things like, in a perfectly carved term, the angle of the term, the the angle of the term is exactly equal to the angle of the reverse camber of the ski. If you got the ski built right and you did the turn right, then those then you can do that equation. Uh, you can ski, however, without knowing that. Uh, in fact, I would venture to say 99% of the ski racers that ever lived don't know that fact, and they don't have to worry about it. They just learn how to ski. Now, there's a point here, and that is often you can take elements of the background and foreground them. You can treat them uh, as part of the network, but it's a mistake to think that when they're actually functioning, they function as further beliefs. Now, this is going to be important to us when we talk about the emotions, because in many cases with the emotions, you learn a set of background practices. Uh, you learn uh, how, how to fall in love or have an argument or have a fight uh, or a like or dislike somebody. And all of those w will involve more than just your uh, beliefs, but they'll involve s ways of behaving, what you find appropriate or inappropriate. Uh, uh, an example that's standard in the literature is how close do you stand to people when you talk to them? Cultures differ uh, in what's the appropriate standing distance to have a conversation. Uh, in Italy, people tend to get a lot closer than they do in England. And when I was uh, uh, in Oxford and I used to go to international conferences, you would see a standard scene where the Englishman and the Italian would be having a conversation at the conference, and the Italian would be constantly moving in so he could talk to this Englishman, and the Englishman would be constantly moving back, each of them not thinking, I gotta get to follow the 27 centimeter rule. No, they're just trying to get comfortable. I, there's, there's just a certain comfortable distance uh, that the uh, Italian has for carrying on a conversation, and it's much closer than the Englishman has for carrying on a conversation. Now, you can't write that down as a rule. If you try to do it as a rule, the Italian follows the, the 17 centimeter rule and the Englishman follows the 27 centimeter rule, it won't do because, of course, it's very much context dependent. Uh, if it's somebody you're in love with that you're having a conversation or it's a small child and you're trying to change its diaper or whatever, uh, uh, then they, uh, you get a, a different set of practices but rather we have a set of dispositions whereby we find certain things appropriate. Certain things make us comfortable and other things make us uncomfortable, and those are what I'm calling background dispositions. Okay, now uh, this, I, I, I haven't uh, fully uh, spelled us, uh, this out, but I want you to get the basic idea because the basic idea runs dead counter to a certain assumption that we make in our culture, and that is, Cognitive capacities can be made fully explicit as a set of propositions. On the account that I'm giving you, they can't. Uh, I, uh, the, uh, the way, when they're actually functioning, they function as a set of abilities, capacities, dispositions, ways of behaving, and not as a set of propositions with logical relations. Okay, let's stop for questions about that. Yeah. <clears throat> Yes, you're 
you're, uh, you're talking about perception now. Yes. Yeah, perception is loaded with background presuppositions. Uh, I, it is, uh, philosophers often like to remark on the fact that, as they say, you don't see the whole object, you just see part of the surface of the object. You wonder, well, what do they have in mind? What would it be like to see the whole object? But notice, e even assuming that that's the correct description, you take for granted that the object has a side that you don't see. When I look at this wall, I can't see the outside, but I take for granted that the, w that the wall is uh, thick, uh, that there is more to the wall uh, than just meets uh, uh, the eye. Uh, and this is characteristic of all perception. It's traditional in psychology to point out, perception is a function of expectation. You see what you expect to see. But what you expect to see is not just a matter of explicit beliefs, but it's a set of your background ways of coping with reality. One of my favorite examples was when Captain Cook and his men sailed into Sydney Harbor. Uh, the natives uh, didn't pay any attention to this cloud in the water. But the moment guys got off of the ship and got into little boats, uh, the natives panicked because they could recognize these, uh, they could literally see that these were fellow human beings. But this cloud-like object, this big ship, they couldn't see, even see it as a big ship. It's just I, I, something that they didn't notice. You, you uh, see what you expect to see. You have a set of capacities that enable you to see. And of course, uh, the history of art reveals this. It's very interesting to go back and read what intelligent critics said at the dawn of uh, modernism, at the dawn of Impressionism and post-Impressionism. And by and large, a lot of perfectly intelligent critics made idiotic uh, criticisms. They couldn't see, you know, who is this uh, uh, Degas? The paintings are unfinished. Uh, Cezanne, how dumb can you get? He even leaves bits of the canvas still showing. It looks like he hadn't finished uh, the work. Uh, now our eyes have been trained. Now we know how to see, well, most of our eyes have been trained. We know how to see Impressionist uh, paintings, post-Impressionist paintings. Modernism no longer is a mystery to us. So I'll come back to this when we talk about perception. That uh, uh, Perception is an ability, and you have to learn it, and a, par a large part of the ability consists of background abilities, not a set of propositions. Okay, other uh, uh, questions at this point. Now this is going to be important when we get uh, to, uh, the, uh, particularly when we get to the emotions, and I think it's kind of a scandal that nobody has an adequate theory of the emotions. Uh, if you look at the standard literature, it's a very feeble. Uh, South wrote a bad book uh, called Sketch of a Theory of the Emotions. Uh, there's a guy in San Francisco who does um, interesting, his name's Ekman, interesting research on the facial expressions that are typical of emotions. But the, res the problem with that is that a lot of things that are not emotions, uh, he lists as an emotion. He thinks being startled is an emotion. Uh, but he can't list falling in love as an emotion because uh, there's no special facial expression. Now, I think that's a case of letting uh, the uh, uh, methodology dictate uh, the substance. Uh, he wants to study facial expressions. Some emotions, like anger, have a typical facial expression. Other emotions, like uh, uh, being in love, uh, don't have a, a typical facial expression. I would say startled was being startled is not an emotion, uh, but falling in love definitely is. All right, how does the background work? Well, let's say some more about its structure. It seems to me that if we're going to do a serious analysis of these background abilities that I've been talking about, uh, you need to distinguish between what I would call the deep background, that is, things that are common to all human beings. Uh, we all uh, walk upright. We eat through our mouths. Uh, we cope uh, with the gravitational attraction of the Earth. But in addition to the deep background, let's that be up here. This will be the deep background, which is common to all human beings in virtue of their biological makeup. There are local cultural practices. And 
it is the commonality, the deep background, that makes it possible to translate from one language to another. But it's the variation in local cultural practices that make translations harder to do and harder to cope with. Uh, when I first read Proust, I was a teenager. Uh, and the uh, people in, in uh, A La Recherche uh, didn't behave like the people uh, that I uh, mostly knew. They behaved in a kind of strange way. Uh, that had to do with the fact that the local cultural practices were different. But of course, a lot of things I could take for granted. Uh, when uh, they go and have dinner at, this, at these boring people's house at the Verdurin, uh, I know they ate the food through their mouth. Uh, and that's a part of the deep background. They didn't eat by stuffing the food in their ear or trying to absorb it by rubbing it against their skin. All of that is deep background. So deep background is what all human beings share. Local cultural practices have to do with culture, with how one culture differs from another. Now cutting across this, I think there's a difference between how to do things and how things are. And that parallels the traditional philosopher's distinction between the practical and the theoretical. I like the how-to formula better because I don't want to make it all seem theoretical. Uh, how to do things and how things are are related uh, because, for example, if you're trying to cut with a knife, that's how to do things. It won't do if your knife is made of butter. It's got to be made out of something that's reasonably solid, and that's how things are. So you get a correlation between how things are and how to do things. So within the background, you have to distinguish between how much of it is local and how much of it is, uh, is biological, how much of it is universal. And you have to distinguish also uh, between uh, the practical side, how you cope with things and uh, what you can take for granted about uh, the structure and nature of the world around you. Okay, now I want to stop for questions about that because this is, I'm going to go uh, the next step and show how we use all of this apparatus to explain a whole lot of features about intentionality. Yes? So would uh, only biological functions of the human be universal, whereas objective facts would There are all sorts of observer relative facts that are not universal. Now, the, the fascinating question is language. Uh, specific languages uh, contain uh, different uh, features. Uh, but the capacity for language as such, uh, we now have pretty good evidence, is a background ability specific to human beings. All normal human beings can acquire a human language. That's an amazing fact. There are no cultures that lack a language altogether. There are cultures that don't have police forces, don't have democratic governments, and don't even have itemized deductions on their income tax because they don't have income tax, right? Those are not cultural universals. But all cultures have a language. And there is now a pretty good e amount of evidence, though it's not conclusive, uh, that there's a lot of things that all languages have in common. And there was a period when people thought, well, maybe what enables any normal child to learn any language is the fact that the child has programmed into its brain a universal grammar. It has a UG. And the universal grammar, which is programmed into our brain at birth, is a kind of background ability that enables the child to acquire any language. Now, the argument against that traditionally, this is an old idea. It goes back to the 17th century, uh, uh, the idea of a universal grammar. The argument against it was always, but languages differ so much. And the counter argument to that is they don't really differ very much. Uh, they differ in things like, where do you put the verb? Do you, do you put it right there up uh, after the subject? Or do you do what the Germans do and stick it away at the end of the sentence where you get the main verb? Uh, I, in English, you just say, I, uh, I have eaten. But in, uh, I, I, I have I've eaten uh, the, uh, the meal. But in German, German, you have to say, ich habe es gegessen. You've got to stick the damn main verb at the end of the sentence. But that's a trivial difference. Uh, Chomsky puts this by saying, if a Martian linguist could come to Earth, uh, he would uh, think all 
earthlings, all people on earth speak the same language. Uh, just they have different vocabularies. Uh, so they don't understand each other because the vocabularies are different. But basically, it's the same uh, syntactical structure. Now, uh, all of this is very much in dispute. And when I talk about this, I, 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 when, when we apply this stuff at the end of the semester, I'll go over some of these issues about the nature of language. Um, um, but the, uh, the point here is that there are a set of capacities which are in your brain. One of those is the capacity uh, to learn language. Now, there is a dispute. Does that capacity consist in a set of explicit rules and propositions, which would make it, on my jargon, part of the network? Or is it a background ability, like your ability uh, to learn to perceive objects and states of affairs rank around you? That's a dispute between me and these guys. Chomsky thinks it's a set of rules and propositions. Yes? Yeah, there was, uh, two, uh, the question was, how do we acquire an understanding of the background? Uh, and the answer is in uh, two parts. Uh, there's a part that you're born with, and that just has to develop. The child has to have natural ways of coping with reality. But the other part is what you get in upbringing. You understand what is an appropriate way to behave in an appropriate circumstance. Uh, Americans have a lot of very peculiar uh, cultural features which have become part of the local cultural background. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, there used to be a, a, a phenomenon, a dreadful to think of it, called a date. Uh, you had a date with a girl. I don't know if that still exists, but there were very definite set of cultural expectations about what you did on a date, and what you could do on the first date and the second date. I'm embarrassed to think of what horrible it was. Uh, and I, I hope all of that's long since forgotten, but maybe uh, some of you are old enough to remember it, or maybe it still survives in some corners of California. Uh, but in any case, uh, all of that's what I'm uh, calling local cultural practices, and many of those are background. It's what you take for granted. If, if the question is, what is it that people find appropriate without having to say anything? What goes without saying? Uh, that's a mark that is uh, probably a part of the background. We're talking about background capacities and dispositions. Yes? No. No, that anything you can describe. Okay, there's nothing that's indescribable. I, I sometimes you can't give very good descriptions, but nothing is indescribable. What I'm saying is, when the background is functioning as background, it does not function as a set of propositions. When I walk across this room, or when my dog catches the ball uh, by putting his mouth where the where the tennis ball is going to come. He does not do that by doing a set of propositional derivations using a, a, an elaborate set of quadratic equations. He acquires a physical skill. When I ski down the mountain, I am not applying a whole lot of propositions. Uh, some of them are. Uh, that looks like uh, 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 that snow over there looks like crud, so stay away from that. But the ability to move my body through the slope in this way is not a set of propositional derivations. So let me answer this question explicitly because it's a crucial question. What we're going to do is try to describe the background, and that's a part of. I've just gotten started with that. But when the background is functioning, it does not function as descriptions. It does not function as a set of propositions, even though, of course, we have to give propositions to describe it. Okay, we'll stop there. And just to repeat, if you're interested in applying for...